Hi! In this video we are going to write a computer language interpreter that can run complex code like this. Just 168 lines of Python will do the trick. The grammar you see here is a mixture of C, basic and whatnot. I've made it up to study interpreters and compilers. I'm going to give you my deliberately narrow introduction to this field by just showing you one solution that works. In that I follow Jack W. Crenshaw's seminal Let's Build a Compiler a fantastic learning resource. I want to thank Jack for putting his expertise into making many underlying concepts accessible. The link to his text is in the description. In the near future my plan is to port an interpreter to my minimal CPU system here, where it has to run in assembly. So we better only use low-level Python in today's draft. Let's jump in. In a nutshell interpreters process each input statement by running a suitable machine code snippet. And compilers just bundle all these snippets as an executable for later use. In any case, we compare our input to a formal grammar and identify corresponding actions to be taken. It's up to us to specify these grammar rules. But first, let's get some groundwork done to load and be able to scan over a source file. I'll paste little code blocks and only briefly highlight some aspects. I recommend pausing the video if you want to take a closer look. We take the first argument of the command line here as a file name and load our program text into a null terminated string. We'll use a program counter index to move along the data. All access is funneled through dedicated functions. Look returns the character at the current index. In case we hit a hash sign denoting the start of the comment, we immediately scan over the rest of the line. And take returns the current character and moves one step forward. Take string only consumes a specific string. Next moves to and returns the next non white space character. And take next consumes white spaces including a certain character. Let's see if we can load this source file here and get it printed back to the console with its comments removed. And the comments are indeed gone now. We'll also need a bunch of recognizer functions to determine whether a given character is a digit, a letter, an alphanumeric or an operator. Since we will have to parse a lot of alphanumeric identifiers for variables or subroutines, I've also put this take next lnum function, which does exactly that by using our recognizers. Okay, that didn't hurt too much. Now let's write down what it means to process a program by using an abstract notation called Bacchus now form. Delimiters here denote classes and language keywords are written in plain text. The double colon equals means is defined as. So within this grammar processing a program means processing a statement and processing a statement means recognizing the keyword print. The actions taken once we've found print are not shown in this notation. For now we'll just output print to the console. As it stands our grammar allows for a single print statement. We want to support multiple statements, possibly grouped together in blocks and to be executed in loops. So let's account for that. What's going on here? The items enclosed in square brackets are optional, where the star sign means repeating any number of times. The vertical bar denotes a logical OR. Now processing a program means processing a number of blocks, where each block may either consist of a single statement or, enclosed in curly brackets, further blocks. This clever definition makes use of recursion by referencing back to itself. Now this becomes a legal program. Before we get too fancy, let's implement that. You'll be amazed how easy this is going to be. Let's call a program function that processes our code by looking for blocks. The blocks function is also really short. It scans for a single statement or curly brackets enclosing more blocks. And here we implement our dummy print statement. Let's also print out a potential error message. Let's throw our test program at it and see what we get. Alright, the seven prints were passed and executed correctly. Great! At this point we need to look into the future. 
We already know that in real programs some blocks will be active, while others may be rendered inactive by control structures. That's a very important feature of code. So let's account for that by passing a boolean variable act downstream to each statement, so that it knows whether it's active or not. And let's consider a break statement in a while loop. A break needs to be able to deactivate its surrounding loop upstream, where break can be nested anywhere inside this loop. So that calls for passing the variable act by reference and not by value, which is for a simple boolean not possible in Python. So let's make act a single element list instead and see if that works. I'm throwing in this break statement now. Our program should hold after four prints. Now that is looking good. Let's put break a little bit earlier. OK. We now have all the magic ingredients of our interpreter at our fingertips. The rest is straightforward and we could go on forever improving it step by step. But I've promised you one solution that works. So let's instead go over the full Bacchus Nauer form of our toy language in one go and then review the code that implements it. We already know that a program consists of consecutive blocks where a block can either be a statement or in curly brackets more blocks. We now have more options for a statement. We have print, if else and while break. Sub defines a subroutine and GoSub calls it. The last option with the equal sign is a variable assignment. That looks familiar by now, except for some new classes I've colored. Let's walk through them step by step. The print statement now needs to be followed by an expression, optionally followed by more comma separated expressions. Down at the bottom we see that an expression can either be a string or a math expression. We'll have to learn more about them later. The if and while statements are control structures. They rely on another type of boolean expression. The blue identifier class denotes any kind of alphanumeric label used to name subroutines or variables. Now let's find out what a string expression is. We see that a string expression is a string, optionally followed by more strings concatenated by a plus sign. Now what is a string? It can either be a literal string between quotation marks, a string conversion of an integer, some user input or a string variable. Also not too complicated, but it gets more interesting in a second. Let's now look at basic math expressions. First thing to note is that they are composed of terms, each separated by a plus or minus sign denoting addition or subtraction. In much the same manner each term is composed of factors, separated by a star or slash sign denoting multiplication or division. A factor can either be a number or a variable. It's interesting to note how easily the precedence rules of the operators are implemented here. But hang on, much complexity can be introduced by nesting expressions inside round brackets. But all this complexity can be dealt with by realizing that expressions inside brackets are just another type of factor. Again self-reference comes to the rescue here. Going back to our overview, the only thing missing now are boolean expressions inside our control structs. After we've covered math, that's an easy one. A boolean expression is composed of boolean terms, separated by a logical OR sign. It's kind of analogous to addition. A boolean term is composed of boolean factors, separated by a logical AND sign. Again analogous to multiplication. And a boolean factor in the end can always be only true or false, right? Well, that will be too easy. Again here comes something sneaky. The thing that results in a boolean factor being true or false is a relation. That's the connection to our math expressions. 
A relational operator can either be equals, not equals, less than, greater than, less or equal, or greater or equal. It also makes sense to allow for relations of string expressions. Here I'll only consider the equals and not equals operators. And this is it. The whole Bacchus Naur form of our language fits on two pages. Now let's implement that. Bear with me, it's only 100 lines of Python from here. First we improve our statement function to account for all keywords and treat anything else as an assignment. Next we bring print up to speed. Print now expects to find an expression, possibly followed by another comma-separated expression. Next come assignments. We look for an alphanumeric variable name, an equal sign and an expression and store the result in a dictionary named variable. Let's initialize that down at the bottom. Now subroutine definitions. We scan an identifier, store the current program counter in our variable dictionary and scan over the subsequent code block inactively. Note that we store that variable with an additional p label to distinguish it from simple strings or numbers for which we later will use s and i labels. The gosub instruction is easy too. We look up the program counter of the called subroutine in our dictionary, jump to it and after the subroutine block is processed we set the program counter to right after the call. Now let's try the if-else statement. We first read in the result of a boolean expression. If it's true we execute the first code block, otherwise we just scan over it. If we find an else we execute its block actively if our initial boolean expression was false. While is even shorter but a bit tricky. First we make a local copy of our deactivation switch act. The reason being that if our while loop gets shut down by a break statement this must only affect the enclosing while loop and must not be propagated further upstream. Next we process the while loop as long as its boolean expression remains true and skip over it inactively otherwise. On our overview we see that we've already covered quite some ground. Each and every function we've defined so far was quite short and relatively straightforward. We have managed to bury all the complexity that arises from recursion in the structure of our interpreter itself, that is, in the stack of our CPU really. We need to work on expressions now, on string, math and boolean expressions. Let's begin with string expressions. Being defined as a string followed by an optional concatenating plus sign and another string and so on. Next let's implement a string. We account for four different string types here. Literal strings, a conversion result of a math expression, a user input or the content of a string variable. Now math expressions. We need to parse a leading minus followed by a math term, optionally followed by an add or subtract operator and another math term and so on. And following strictly our BNF cheat sheet here, a term is nothing more than a factor, potentially followed by a multiply or divide symbol and another factor and so on. Defining a math factor is a bit more work, but again only due to different options. We can have round brackets surrounding another math expression, we can have a number, the value of a string and again a variable. Going back to our overview we see that all that is left to do are boolean expressions. Again only a boolean factor will involve a bit of code since here we implement relations. So a boolean expression consists of terms separated by an OR. A boolean term consists of boolean factors separated by an AND symbol. The important piece missing is the boolean factor being the result of a relation. In case we are comparing math expressions we have six relational operators implemented. For strings I've chosen to only implement the equals and not equals relations. 
For both cases, we allow for a possible leading negation or not operator. Whew, and this is it. We are almost ready for some test runs. Let's do two more things though. Let's improve upon our error printing routine. Right now it only prints the error message. It'll be nice to have it also show the actual line and line number. And although we've defined all subclasses of an expression, the expression itself is still missing. Let's insert that very last piece between the commands and the expression section of our code. As you can see, we have to do a little look ahead to determine whether we are dealing with a string or with math. And it's only here where we label results either with an S or an I for string or integer data. Okay, let's save and throw our intro test program at this interpreter now. Hmm, we start with a subroutine definition. The actual program starts down here with printing hello world and calling the subroutine. A is a string, B is a math expression, which should evaluate to, let's see, 9, 18, 20, 30, 90, minus 21, and print that out. The if statement should evaluate to true, and the while loop should break out after printing 10 dots. Let's get this mess interpreted. And yes, our program runs correctly. Let us introduce some typos now to see if we can catch them. Wow, this is already a working computer language. I hope that I could demystify the whole thing a bit and encourage you to implement your own syntax or additional features like function parameters, more data types, arrays and so on. I plan on porting this interpreter to the minimal CPU system I've built. But to be honest, I haven't decided on a target language. What would you like to see there? A stripped down Python? A basic? Or a tiny C? Or the grammar mix of today's video? In any case, thank you very much for following along. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. I hope you got something out of all this. Take care. Bye.